Hello. My name is Ann Dean, and I'm a photographer who lives in Lawrence, Kansas. I'd like to welcome you to the Humanities Kansas Big Idea Series. Thank you for taking the time to be here today. And thanks to Humanities Kansas for inviting me to participate in this project. For more information about Humanities Kansas, visit their website at www.humanitieskansas.org or visit their Facebook page. Today I'll be presenting my photo essay, Images from the Mind of a Biracial Black Woman. I'm a photographer, a documenter, a storyteller, a silent observer. The art of photography puts you in a unique position to observe the world around you from a distance, to record flashes of life, fractions of seconds that have meaning to you and will go on to live forever. When I was very young, I realized the power of the still image. I remember seeing the breathtaking and haunting photograph of Florence Owens Thompson, the migrant mother by Dorothea Lange, who became the face of the Great Depression. The piercing eyes of Sharbat Gula, the Afghan girl by Steve McCurry on the cover of my mother's National Geographic. The desperation, the urgency, and the freedom of Gordon Park's emerging man crawling out from the depths. These photographs stuck with me throughout my life like a great image does. The photographers brought us into the worlds of their subjects and I wanted to know more. It is incredibly valuable to be able to stop for a moment, take a look at the world, appreciate the tiniest details and capture them from behind the camera. The fleeting moments in life that we all take for granted and that give our lives meaning. To tell your stories from your own unique point of view that only you can see. This is why I decided to become a photographer. I was born in 1970 and adopted by a black family in St. Louis, Missouri, who had already adopted a baby boy, my brother, 18 months earlier. My parents had a small two bedroom apartment in the city, but just before my birth, they decided to find a larger home with more space for their growing family. My father had been awarded the position of chief microbiologist at St. Louis City Hospital, so they were ready for a fresh start. They soon found a house on the north side of the city, very close to the county line or what would soon be known as the suburbs. At the time, it was an all white neighborhood where the unwritten rule was no blacks after 6 p.m. unless they were domestic workers. As a result, they were petitioned by the residents who tried to block them from moving in, but my parents weren't having it and they fought against what they called a line restriction. They felt that if they could vote in elections and go to war and fight for this country, which my father had done in Korea, then they deserved to live anywhere they pleased. So they didn't back down, and despite these actions, they moved into their new home, while at the same time, some of the neighbors moved out. This was the beginning of white flight in our area, and by the time I went to high school, our neighborhood would be almost entirely black. When I looked into the faces of my family, blackness is what I saw, what I've always seen. I'd never really known anything else. This was my identity, where I felt most comfortable and at ease. Although I knew deep down inside, there might be something a little different about me. I was five years old when my mother told us of our adoptions and about my racial background. You see, I'm the product of a black man and a white woman 
which makes me biracial by definition. But in my heart and mind, I'm black because my family is black. So back then I shrugged it off. I knew who I was and I never really questioned it until I went to school and I became socialized. My classmates would ask rudely, what are you? It always caught me off guard. What do you mean? I'm a human being, a citizen of the world, I would think. But they wanted a concrete answer. Even at that young age, race was an issue. And I learned that I would have to answer those questions for the rest of my life. The white kids would stare at my face, my skin. They would touch my hair, which still happens all the time. They asked me why I didn't talk black. The black girls teased me relentlessly. They called me white girl, high yellow, said I talked proper, and hated my so-called good hair. They wanted to fight me in the neighborhood, in the schoolyard. The mere sight of me made them irritated and angry. I could always feel it the moment it started, and I would immediately work to diffuse the situation. But I thought to myself, why were they saying these things? What was happening? Why did they hate me? I was a black girl too. Why couldn't they understand this? I was in between worlds on the outside. This was further proven to me when our parents decided that we would get a better education and more opportunities by entering into the city of St. Louis desegregation program. So starting in junior high, we were bused, as they say, to the all-white wealthy enclave of Clayton, Missouri. Even though my stay-at-home mother drove us to school each day until we could drive ourselves. It was tough leaving the neighborhood and entering into this completely new world that I knew nothing about and couldn't believe even existed once I arrived. I was shocked by their lifestyle. The houses, the cars, the clothes, the money. Was this for real? Did people really live like this? But I adapted to my new environment, made friends, and I realized that the gap could be bridged, but it had to be done delicately. Tread lightly, don't be too aggressive, watch and learn. It was here at Clayton that I saw The Learning Tree by Gordon Parks, an African-American photographer, writer, director, and composer from Fort Scott, Kansas. It tells the story of a young boy growing up in rural Kansas and becoming a man at a time when racism was the norm and a part of daily life. The film was beautiful, heavy, tragic, and it left a mark on me. A couple years later, I would read his book, A Choice of Weapons, which would solidify my understanding of the power of the still image as an art form. In it, Park says, I picked up the camera because it was my choice of weapon against what I hated most about the universe, racism, intolerance, poverty. I could have just as easily picked up a gun like so many of my childhood friends did, most of whom were murdered or put in prison. But I chose not to go that way. I saw that the camera could be a weapon against poverty, against racism, against all sorts of social wrongs. I knew at that point I had to have a camera, he said. And so did I. These are just a few images from Gordon Park's book, Segregation Story, where he uses photography to tell the story of the Jim Crow South. Gordon Parks documented the restraints, open and hidden, on an extended African-American family persevering in the segregated South. This image is called Outside Looking In, and I could definitely relate to that. My mother gave me my first camera for my birthday when I was in eighth grade a Nikon L35 autofocus with attachable lenses, and I took it everywhere. She was a painter herself and always encouraged us to experiment with visual art, music, theater, anything that might interest us and spark our curiosity. 
I soon became aware that I could speak through the camera. I discovered a whole new world, and I realized that the camera does not lie. It expresses the truth of a situation, no matter what. I was obsessed with capturing the beauty of the world that often goes unseen. I understood the power that one single image could conjure, and I wanted to harness this power and learn how to be the best I could be at telling stories through photography. At the same time though, I could stay out of the mix and it felt so comfortable to be behind the camera. I began studying other photographers' work, paying close attention to the way they told their stories. Their images expressed feeling and emotion. Pain. Discomfort. Fear. Courage. Beauty. Love. Joy. And truth. I was especially drawn towards the images from the civil rights photographers and how they were able to encapsulate the feelings of an entire movement towards social justice with only a few choice photographs. It was then that I really understood the phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words. I moved to Lawrence, Kansas in 1988 and studied English at KU, but photography was never far from my mind and I always had my camera with me to record my journey. I remember one college class that I took called The Black Experience in the United States Since Emancipation, which would be taught by a female professor and I was excited. The room was crowded and the ceilings were low but it was nice to see that the class was very split racially, which was rare, with white students, mostly from small Kansas towns who'd never met a black person before, to black students from larger cities who had little to no interactions with white people. It was tense. I would sit quietly and listen week after week to the arguments, to the frustrations and the prejudices that each group had towards the other. When I finally spoke up and tried to find some common ground, the professor called me a bleeding heart liberal and quickly dismissed my comment, which cut me to the core. I thought, how will we ever learn to understand each other if we cannot hear one another and try to come together in some way? And why does that make me a bleeding heart liberal? As if it were more comfortable to perpetrate the hate. It was discouraging to say the least. There have been so many other experiences along these lines in my life, too many to count. What lies at the core of this? I think it's fear. Fear of what you do not understand, intolerance, and being closed off to learning something new about your fellow human beings. I also realized that my experience growing up was rare and that I wanted to share it somehow. So I started telling my own stories and showing people the world through my eyes and from my perspective. I learned to study social situations, to read the room, to blend in and become a chameleon so that I could maneuver easily with my camera, no matter what company I was in. A silent witness recording my observations about the world we all live in straddling the line between black and white, not wanting to rock the boat. Going to school at Clayton each day 
and then back home to my neighborhood on the north side in the evenings had a profound effect on me. It helped me learn to adapt more easily to different settings, and it allowed me to be flexible within them. <clears throat> After I graduated from KU, I lived in Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula for a short time, where I still visit most every year. This experience furthered my understanding of different cultures as I got to know the Maya people who opened my eyes to many things and to different ways of thinking that I had never imagined before. They had a manner of being, a contentment that I hadn't experienced before. I try to travel as much as I possibly can to expand my horizons and to broaden my knowledge about this diverse world and its inhabitants. One of the most enriching travel experiences I've ever had was visiting Cuba for our honeymoon in 2002. To me, it was a photographer's dream. The Cuban people have very little and have put up with so much. Yet what they lack in material things, they more than make up for through art, music, and their general attitude towards life. They made me understand that all the stuff we think we need is just an illusion and that life is about so much more. We loved it so much that we went back in 2017 and I'm sure I'll go back to visit again someday. The world we live in today is changing constantly and with the pandemic we're currently living through, these are very uncertain times. Ironically, a disease that attacks the lungs while we are all shouting collectively, we can't breathe. There is still misunderstanding, ignorance and violence in terms of race, and so many of the same wrongs are still being perpetrated today. Time seems to have stoked the flames of this fire somehow. And it's astonishing how these scenes echo the same images that we all saw from the civil rights demonstrations in the 1960s. How can this be? These are the children, the grandchildren and the great grandchildren of the freedom fighters still fighting for the same goals, justice and equality for all human beings here and everywhere in the world. This takes strength, tenacity, and courage. And it's inspiring to see young and older people today coming together and standing up for what's right, for a common good, for what we all deserve. We've come so far, but let's look honestly at where we still are and what we are doing as a people, as a country, and as these United States. Just a few days ago, I took a survey and one of the questions asked what race I identify with most. Black and biracial were options. I am both. Yet I still identify as a black woman and I still consider myself to be a citizen of the world. But I also know where I come from and who I am and nobody can take that away from me, not with harsh words, teasing, insults or hate speech and I will remain true to myself no matter what others think they see. These days I teach photography to youth and adults at the Lawrence Art Center and I run my own freelance photography business. Photography will always be a part of my life in some way and I'll continue to tell my stories, seek out new subject matter and expand on my viewpoints to see the world in my own unique way. And remember, it's never too late to learn something new about yourself and the world around you. So find something that you enjoy and that makes you happy, where you can express yourself and tell your own stories. In the final words of his memoir, Gordon Park says, 
poverty and bigotry would still be around, but at least now I could fight them on even terms. The significant thing was having a choice of weapons with which to fight them most effectively. Your choice of weapon can take the form of a pen or a paintbrush, a trumpet or a drum, a microscope or a shovel, a saute pan or a wrench, a sewing machine, a blackboard, a book, your vote, your voice, or a simple conscious effort to be understanding, compassionate, and kind to the individuals around you. But what is most important is that we do have a choice. What will you choose? Thank you so much for joining me today. And thank you to Humanities Kansas.